Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern and that means it's time to begin another of our monthly Coco Ross Weather Talk webinars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our own Noah Newman. Out there somewhere on the roads of Colorado today is Coco Ross founder Nolan Duskin, and unfortunately he will not be able to join us for this particular broadcast. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in partly cloudy Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we'll be recording it for future viewing on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from the National Science Foundation and donations from listeners like you. Well, during today's webinar, we're going to take a look and talk about the weather and climate of the Great Plains. And many of you with us today either live on the plains or lived there at one time or visited there or, or, or know something about the Great Plains. And blizzards, tornadoes, heat bursts, you name it, it's uh, the Great Plains, the land of extremes, just as the title of this webinar points out. Well, we're in for a treat today. We have climatologist Natalie Umflett, the acting director of the High Plains Regional Climate Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Natalie is the interim director and regional climatologist of the High Plains Regional Climate Center. She holds a BS in Meteorology and Climatology and an MS in Geosciences, both from the University of Nebraska there in Lincoln. And she's currently pursuing a PhD in Natural Resource Sciences with a specialization in climate assessment and impacts. Although she has lived in Nebraska for quite some time, she's originally from Gainesville, Georgia. And she became interested in the weather when a tornado hit her hometown, including her high school, back on March 20th, 1998. Other things for fun, Natalie enjoys cooking, gardening, running, and traveling, and she's also a Nebraska Cornhuskers fan. Well, Natalie, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, before we start out with the presentation, why don't you tell us a little bit about that tornado experience and how you got interested in weather? Sure. So that was just one of the tornado experiences that I have had growing up um, when I was in first grade. Tornado went through a different town I was living in, little town of Tacoa, Georgia, up in the mountains of northeast Georgia, and that went down the main street of town. And that was a pretty interesting experience being six years old and you could hear the roar of the tornado outside. Um, luckily, um, my family was okay, everything was fine, but pretty interesting experience. And then later on, uh, as a 10th grader in high school, uh, getting ready for school that morning and uh, you know, started to hear friends calling in really early in the morning, making sure everybody was okay. And so everybody turned on our TVs to see what was going on. This is before we had tornado sirens down there. It's dark, it's early morning. and we woke up to find out that, uh, that a tornado had gone right through our high school. So um, pretty interesting events and definitely helped uh, shape my view on the weather and what we can learn from it and how we can plan and adapt to it. And what better place to watch tornadoes than living on the, on the Great Plains now? I'm, I'm sure you, you've seen a few out there. Sure have. Well, Natalie, let's go ahead and start start your presentation, and uh, we'll take questions from our listeners after you're done. Thanks, thanks for being with us today. Sounds good. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to start off with kind of a thought exercise, and then I'll get into a little bit about what organization I'm with and what it is we do, and then we'll jump on into talking about the weather and climate of the plains. So, so what do you think of when you think of the plains? I know we've got people from all across the country on the line here today, and not everybody's been to the Plains. It's a pretty big area, but um, maybe not everybody's been there, but you've seen pictures, probably seen iconic pictures like of the Dust Bowl, maybe of bison. Um, so what is it that you think of? When my friends and family uh, you know, found out that I was going to be spending a lot of time out in Nebraska, going to school here, and then later finding a job, and and settling down here, these are some of the comments that I got. Oh well, it's pretty boring. It's pretty flat out there. Oh, that's just flyover country. I'm going to go ahead and assume if you're on the line, this isn't how you think, but a lot of people do, and I say, no way, no way are the planes boring flat or flyover country. Is it empty? 
Parts of it sure are, but isn't that beautiful? You can drive out into the country and not see anyone for miles. Look at that beautiful scenery. Open skies, we got lots of them. Lots of scenery for you, lots of ways to watch the weather. Iconic bison, we got those too. So there's a lot of different images that come to mind for me when I think of the plains. And it's not flat, it's not boring, it's not flyover country. It's beautiful, it's open skies. It's also never a dull moment. So out here on the plains, we've got lots of different weather. It's all impacted by our climate. And we can have fun days like this one, just back in November of last year, where we have a tornado watch right here in the yellow. So what we're looking at here, this is Kansas, this is Nebraska, and this is Colorado. So you got this tornado watch right through here with a blizzard warning right beside it. There's even a tornado warning hidden somewhere in there, as we can see, but it's probably crowded out. So there really is never a dull moment on the plane. So I'm going to step back just a second here, kind of give you an overview of what it is that I do here at the center, what it is we're trying to accomplish, and then we'll dive right in. So at the High Plains Regional Climate Center, so you can see that here in the purple, so we work together with five other centers to cover the country. And our mission is to increase the use and availability of climate data and information. And why do we want to do that? Well, climate impacts all sorts of decisions. It impacts everything from the wardrobe that you're going to buy all the way to agriculture. When are you going to plant? When are you going to harvest? It impacts transportation. What happens when you get a big blizzard rolling through Wyoming and I-80 shuts down? has big impacts. And so climate, weather and climate impact so many different sectors that it's good to have those sectors be served by people who understand the data and can translate that for them. We operate in this three tiers of climate services. So a lot of you know Nolan. He's a state climatologist of Colorado. So he's over here in the state climatologist side, the local level. We sit in at the regional level here, the Regional Climate Center, and there's also in the national level, the National Centers for Environmental Information based out of Asheville, North Carolina. And so we all work together to try to serve the people of our regions and help them out with their climate needs. We've got six people on staff right now this full time. We just hired a new undergraduate intern recently. And uh, some of you uh, might see some of these pictures pop up again, so keep an eye out for those. So one of the main things we do is try to turn data into information. Okay? There's a lot of different data points out there. There's thousands of people taking observations every single day. Some of you are on the line today. You're Cocoa Raz observers. There's also the Weather Service uh, Cooperative Observer Network. There's automated stations all across the country. And pulling all those thousands of observations together in one place where we can understand the big picture of what's going on, not just that one little station. That's what we do. So we try to get that information from the weather station all the way into a database that then goes on to make some information like these really cool maps here. And so this is a Kokora site. So our own Crystal Styles has her own site. She's an observer. And her information goes in to our database and into our products like these maps. We also try to give uh, the data a historical context. Okay? So some people, the map would be just fine. But others need to know, well, how did that summer precipitation impact agriculture? Were there any negative aspects to that? What if it was really dry? Was there a drought? Um, and so pulling all that information together into a historical context really helps people understand. Because sometimes you see a map and you say, oh, OK, well, it was really wet in Missouri, so right here. But what did that mean for the state? Was that the wettest summer on record, or was it just a little bit higher than usual? And so we try to take that data from the data point into the information and then try to give that a historical context. And so do we use COCORAS data? Absolutely. And so this is a graph of the last year of precipitation at my friend's house over in Berthoud, Colorado. She is, she and her husband are Kokoraza observers. You can also get these really awesome accumulated precipitation graphs. 
And so you can see here that I pluck, you can hover over the map. It's not going to do it here. I've got PowerPoint running. But on the site, you can hover over. You can see that one day they got almost three and a half inches of rain. And it gives you your whole accumulated precipitation. So absolutely, we love using COCORA's data. It helps improve the decisions that people make. And you can get uh, your own station data at this link here. It'll only be up briefly, but don't worry, I've got the link at the end. So if you don't have time to write that down, that's A-OK. -okay. Natalie, would that be for folks all throughout the country or just in the High Plains area? That's for everyone throughout the country. Yes. Okay, so you great. Can, you can put in your station ID or you could put in, um, you know, you could put in the town you're in. It'll pull up all the stations around you. If you, if you put in your ID, it'll pull up your station. But if you put in, maybe you put in Gainesville, Georgia, it'll pull up all the stations around you. You can pick the one that you want. So, okay, great. Yeah, and we'll, list that, we'll list that, that at the end. Okay, thanks. Yep. So for this talk, when I talk about the plains, I'm not talking about the whole plains. Okay, so not the Texas up through the, up through the um, Canadian Prairie Provinces. I'm talking about the six-state region here in purple. So Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Colorado, and Wyoming. So I just want to set that out from the start. Not to leave anybody out, but but the southern region will have their chance to, to get in Oklahoma and Texas later on. So I just want to start off with a little geography of the region. So a lot of people do think the region's flat, and I guess there are some places that are flat, but we really do have this elevation gradient from east to west up to the Rockies, um, which are there. So Rockies to our west, we've got the Gulf of Mexico to our south, and we've got Canada, so we've got open space all the way through Canada up into their plains in the Arctic to our north. And that helps shape the types of air masses that come into the region. And so we get hot, dry air coming up from the southwest. We get warm, moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. And we've got cold, dry air coming down from Canada. And so this mix of the air masses really help define the type of storms that we get here. And also, so if you think back to some of my pictures that I showed of the plains, it's pretty continuous as far as vegetation. Much of the area has crops or it has grasslands. There's not a lot of trees to block all these air masses coming in and out. And so that makes us the windiest region of the country. And so this is a pretty cool uh, map here from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And what they've got here is the average annual wind speeds at about 80 meters. And so a lot of the wind turbines that go up are about that tall. Some are taller. And you can see all that purple stripe right through the middle of the country. So we're looking at about 8.5 to 9, 9.5 uh, meters per second. But most of us don't think in meters per second. So we're thinking about, oh, 15 to 20 miles per hour on average for the year doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think a lot of times during the day there isn't a lot of wind, so for the whole year, 20 miles an hour is pretty pretty good. So we got the windiest part of the region, of the country, and a lot of those winds are either coming from the north or coming from the south. And so we've got this windrose plot. I'm going to pick on Fargo, North Dakota for this one. And so you can see that the majority of their winds are either coming from the south, southeast, or the north, northwest. And that's a similar pattern that you would see all across the Plains region. Of course, it's a little different in the mountains. You get a lot of different, um, a lot of different local aspects there. But for the most part, we've got either north winds or south winds. We also have these variations across the region in temperature and precipitation. And so it's probably not too surprising that the warmer areas of the region are to the south with the colder areas of the region to the north. But we also have this east to west precipitation gradient. And this really helps define the region. And so we've got wetter weather on the eastern side and then drier weather on the western side. So the further you get away from the Gulf of Mexico, the further you get away from that moisture source, the drier you're going to be. So we can see, so right down here, we got the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, all that moisture plume coming up through here, through Louisiana and Arkansas and Texas and Oklahoma. But the further you get from that, 
the drier it's going to be. So we'll get into both of these. We're going to delve into temperature and then precipitation and move into some severe weather. So like I said, we have this north to south temperature gradient. Um, but what do these tell us? So we're, we're going to pick on Wichita for this one. So down here in southern Kansas is saying that the average annual temperature somewhere between 55 and 60 degrees. Okay. Well, the averages only tell us part of the story. Because if we take a look at this graph, and what we've got here, this is a whole year for Wichita. So all of these blue lines is the day-to-day -day low temperature, high temperature, low temperature, high temperature. And you can see that throughout the year. That brown behind that, that's going to be our normals. That's a 30-year average of temperatures. So the bottom of that is our uh, low temperature. Top of that is high. And then these uh, pink and blue, we've got our record. Okay, so for each day, we've plotted out the record high and the record low. And so we can see that for Wichita, they have a huge range in temperature. So back in 1982, they hit negative 21 degrees. And in 1954, they hit a maximum of 113 degrees. So we can say the average annual temperature is somewhere between 55 and 60, but it really doesn't tell us a whole much. It doesn't, doesn't tell us that there's a huge range that can occur. And there's a big range even throughout the year because we have our warm uh, summer months and our cold winter months. And if you're like me and you see graphs like this, you might be thinking, what in the world is going on there? Is that an error? There must be something wrong with the data. Turns out that's a high 83 degrees on Christmas Eve of 1955. There were really strong southwesterly flow and stations all across Kansas and Colorado and some into Nebraska and Wyoming, they had temperatures 20 to 30 degrees above normal. And so that just happened to be one of those things. It's not a data error. That really did occur. But gosh, let's go back to that wind. What about that wind? When we see that, you know, there was a record low of negative 21 in Wichita, that's cold. But sometimes we have those temperatures occur with, with winds, and that can really push our wind chills down. So it's not necessarily the actual temperature that's out there, but it's that temperature that you feel when you go out there. So I thought I'd throw up this little climatology that shows the number of days that the wind chill is negative 25 or less so for this region. And so you can see down towards the Wichita area, less than three, three days per month, or sorry, three days per winter. So that's not too bad. But if you take a look up there in North Dakota, we're looking at nearly a month's worth of days where the wind chill is below negative 25. And that can be pretty, that can be pretty bad because um, you don't want to get uh, frostbite. Let's go back to this graph. So we've got this nice bell-shaped curve. We've got warm temperatures in the summer. We've got cooler temperatures in the winter. Well, how does that compare to other regions of the country? Is that what the temperature graph would look like everywhere else? Turns out it's not. So here we've got an example from Hilo, Hawaii. And you can see here throughout the year, there isn't a whole lot of variation in temperatures. It's all staying in between, you know, about the high 60s for lows through the, oh, about 80, 84 degrees for highs. So most days are pretty much the same. You probably wouldn't notice day to day. So our, our temperature pattern is very different from other temperature patterns. And when I think about temperatures out in the plains, and I think about the impacts to different sectors, one thing that really gets me going are the first and last frosts. And it's not just for large-scale agriculture. This really does impact your local gardens, too. So I've got my little garden out in the backyard. Haven't planted it quite yet, but it's about to go in. And when that first uh, freeze happens, and when that last freeze happens, really does impact my gardening activities. And so you can see there's a pretty big range across the region. So we can look at that first fall freeze happening as late as late October on average down in Kansas, but then through late September up through uh, parts of North Dakota and Wyoming. 
And interestingly, this past year, we had really late um, freezes. And I know that folks up in, even in South Dakota, were harvesting tomatoes in September, October. I know that down here in Nebraska, um, gosh, that grass was still growing. I had to mow that grass even in December. And it was a really short season. Uh, stuff started, uh, plants started coming out really early in the season. I really like the example from Montana, a little bit out of the region, but they had crocus, crocus flowers coming out in February. So really short winter season this year. And you can look at that based on these first frost and last frost. And we've had some big ones. We've had some big ones that impact the region. A lot of you may remember the Easter freeze of 2007. That was a really big, um, really big impactful event. Um, it was really warm prior, had a real big cold snap, and it really impacted agriculture, especially to the east of here, although Nebraska and Kansas were impacted. There is one that I want to highlight called the Armistice Day Blizzard. I put freeze in parentheses because for our region, it really was the freeze part that had the big impact. And so back in 1940, there was a big storm that rolled through, the brunt of which happened right to our east in the Midwest. They had huge snow accumulations. It was really impactful for them. But in southeast Nebraska, it was a pretty interesting situation. So prior to this blizzard and freeze, uh, it had been really dry. And crops were suffering. And there was a really nice rainfall that came through. And all the trees sucked up this moisture. Wasn't too long after that this big storm came. And it dropped temperatures tremendously. So one part of the week, you're sitting in the 60s. Next thing you know, you have several days where your high temperatures are below freezing and down towards zero degrees. And so the stories go that all of these orchards that were down in southeast Nebraska, all those trees that had sucked up that water, you could go outside at night and you could hear the tree trunks popping because they were freezing. And it completely decimated uh, the commercial orchards in that area. Um, and they have now been converted over to row crop. There are a few remaining, like the Kimmel orchards, uh, which I've got pictured here. So they were able to, um, some of their trees survived, and they were able to replant. But that's one of the only ones that, that survived this big freeze. Similar story came in Iowa and other places where their orchards were were wiped out. So we've talked about temperature um, averages. We looked at a year for Wichita. We looked at first, spring, uh, first uh, freeze and last freeze. So what's the temperature doing over time? So here at the center, we took the uh, temperatures from states, from stations all over our region, and we made a graph. We wanted to see, OK, well, how does that compare to average. So if you are in blue, if you got a blue year, you're below average. And if you've got a red year, you're above average. And it's interesting to see that we do have a trend through the High Plains region. You can see that here through this line going up and down. And so through the past, past several years, we've got this upward trend in temperature. And that's kind of what we're seeing, you know, in other places around the around the world. But it's interesting to see that here in our own data. And it does vary. We have been seeing that um, the temperature has been changing a lot by season. And so we can see here these yellows and oranges and reds in this, um, in this little graphic here. The deeper the color, the more change. And so we see that we've got lots here in the winter months. So we've got lots of changes going on in North Dakota and South Dakota there in the winter. We also have some changes going on in the spring as well. But not so much the fall, not so much the summer. And this is what we're seeing across the world as well. The winter months are really, we're seeing a lot of changes. So let's move on to precip. I think that this is probably the area that everybody's excited about. We've got a lot of Cocoa Ross observers on the line. So you want to hear about precipitation. So just as a reminder, we've got this big east to west gradient in precipitation. 
So really defining the characteristics of the region. You can drive across I-80 through Nebraska, and you can see that change just in the vegetation. Out here, you've got a lot more trees. You drive across the, straight, the state, start to see more grasses, get into some scrubland. You can really see that difference coming across there. And just like temperature, our precipitation varies throughout the year. So we've got a dry season in the wintertime. And so put up a plot of all the January averages. And so you can see that a lot of the re regions only getting at most about a half an inch of precipitation. A lot of that's falling is snow. Uh, we also have our wet season. So in the spring and summer, that's when we get the most precipitation. And so you can see here a lot of the regions getting at least two and a half inches of rainfall or more. And so now I'm going to pick on Bismarck, North Dakota. And so you can see this precipitation graph. So we've got on the bottom, we've got all the months of the year. And then we've got it plotted how many inches per month that Bismarck gets on average. And you can see this really nice bell-shaped curve. You've got um, higher precipitation in the spring and the summer with that max in June. And then we've got lower precipitation totals in the winter. And so just like temperature, we do not have the same sort of precipitation graph that other regions have. So I want to pull up a couple just to show, because it's pretty interesting. So this one up here on the left is San Francisco. And you can see that their dry season is actually in the summer, and their wet season is in the winter. So it's kind of the opposite of what we have. And then I pulled out New York because they have a pretty flat precipitation range throughout the year. So the precipitation in all different places across the country really does vary. The climate really does. Um, it's pretty interesting to see when those are. And these kind of things can be really helpful for when you're planning travel because it might be really nice to go to San Francisco in July and August when you know it's not going to be rainy. Well, and here in the plains, like, like we've talked about, it's the land of extremes. So we don't get that nice curve every year. In fact, we probably don't get that many most years. So what we've got here, got an accumulation graph. So we take every single day precipitation, and we add it up, and we add it up, and we add it up. And so I plot it out here. This red line on the bottom, that's the driest year for Bismarck, 1936, Dust Bowl. And then we've got our highest year, 1876. So that's kind of our range, our extremes. The average is out here, this brown line in between. And then I plotted up the past 10 years of precipitation. And you can see, just in the past 10 years alone, precipitation varies widely. So we've got precipitation varying by season. We've got precipitation varying from year to year. So very extreme. And if we take a look at precipitation for the whole region, we can look at how that is or is not changing over time. So you can see here, like before, we've got our years plotted out. And if you are below zero, that means you're drier, so you're in this brown section. If you're above zero, you're in the green, and it's wetter. And so we can follow this trend line. We can see there's wet years, and there's dry years, and there's wet years, and there's dry years. But there's really no trend, so we're not really seeing a big trend in precipitation for the region. But we can pick out some pretty interesting events here. So we've got lots of different uh, areas of dryness. And that's really been an interesting aspect of the plains. So there's always been this boom and bust on the plains. And the precipitation pattern really has had an influence on the settlement pattern of the plains. And so as uh, conditions were favorable, so as you had wet years, People would move out onto the plains, and they would uh, take up farming. And then as drought would set in, they would migrate back out. And so you had this influx of people and out-migration of people over and over and over again. And um, part of that, this is kind of an interesting, we'll, we'll do a little history, history lesson here. Part of that was um, there was some propaganda to try to get people to move out to areas of western Kansas, eastern Colorado, and western Nebraska. So if we remember back from our precipitation map, 
not really getting a whole lot on average. So pretty tough place to do farming in an area this is pre-irrigation. Okay, so we're talking about late 1800s. And so they called this the rain belt. And the theory was that if you came out onto this area, onto the plains, and you uh, dug the sod and you started a farm, that the rain would follow you out there. Okay, so that's where this whole, um, you may have heard the phrase, rain follows the plow, and that's where this came from. So it was a way to try to get people out here, try to lull them out into this area to take up agriculture. And this area is called the rain belt, and you can see kind of these remnants of this. Um, there is actually a rain belt street in Meade, Kansas, out in western Kansas. Um, so there's a little remnant of the days when that happened. And so you had this in-migration, out-migration, this ebb and flow of population into and out of the plains for several years. And that really didn't stop until uh, the advent of irrigation and also government assistance. And so the last big out-migration happened during the Dust Bowl. So we'll get back into, uh, back into the weather after a little history lesson. And so a lot of people think of um, the plains as a great American desert. And that phrase got coined by early explorers. And chances are, if they were out in the plains during one of these really bad drought events, then that's probably why they thought it was kind of desert-like. Because we've had multiple drought events. It's a real common occurrence out here on the plains. So just to list a few on the side, we could spend days talking about all of these. Um, we got some in recent memory, like 2012, early 2000s. 1988, that's a big one. And I want to make a little point here. This picture that I've got, it is of what is termed one of the black blizzards of Dakota. And so when you think Dust Bowl and you think 1930s, a lot of those images you think of Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, kind of that southern central plains, there really actually was a lot of um, Dust Bowl type activity up in the Dakotas as well. And South Dakota, um, actually had the highest percentage of out-migration of any of the states. So it's kind of interesting that it was happening up in the Northern Plains as well, just maybe didn't get as much publicity. Um, so we'll go back to our little precipitation graph. And so we pointed out some of the dry events, but we do have a lot on the green side, right? We've got a lot in the high precipitation category as well. So you can't talk about the plains and not talk about river flooding. Okay, so some of these wet years have had huge impacts um, in places that are around rivers. And so a couple events that I want to just highlight here, and I'm probably not highlighting your favorite one because there's lots of these, but just picked a couple out. Uh, the Red River of the North, and so that's going to be, um, if you're thinking geographically, uh, kind of on the border of North Dakota and Minnesota, towns like Grand Forks and Fargo, right along those. And so flooding has occurred along the Red River of the North over and over and over. And the 1997 flooding event really was one of the biggest ones. In fact, in Grand Forks, they built this obelisk that you see, and it's got some of the markers showing the height that the water actually got. Um, Unfortunately for them, uh, they probably need to add to this because uh, since they've built that, there's been several floods. And you can find pictures online of the flood waters um, with the obelisk poking out of it. So in 1997, uh, huge rain events, uh, lots of snow led to flooding. Uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, 90% of the town was underwater. Uh, you can see here on this image on the bottom left, that's actually the interstate. looks like a lake down there. And this had a huge impact. The estimated impact was about $5.5 billion. And you can't talk about river flooding without mentioning at least the Great Flood of 1993 that impacted the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Huge impacts to agriculture. Lots of land was inundated with an estimated impact of about $35 billion. So river flooding very impactful for the region. But we also have flash flooding, OK? And so river flooding, that's kind of a slow um, you build up of events. A lot of times you have 
maybe a month or two of heavy rain or you have high snowpack, but flash flooding is a shorter period of time. So it could be something like six hours worth of heavy rainfall or several days worth of heavy rainfall that leads to flooding. And so one of the most recent ones uh, would be the historic flooding that occurred back in September of 2003 in Colorado. It was a really incredible event. Um, we here at the High Plains Regional Climate Center were really interested because one of our own was out there um, in Estes Park during the event. Uh, he was just out there for vacation and little did he know uh, what he was going to be up against. But um, he and his family did make it out all right. But there were some really interesting records to come out of there. There's a new 24-hour rainfall record for the state of Colorado. So down near Colorado Springs, almost 12 inches of rain fell in a 24-hour period, which is incredible. And this event really did change the landscape of, the, of uh, a lot of Colorado. If you go up there now, uh, there's lots of scars from landslides. And you can still see remnants of what's happened. And so you can see here in the bottom left, this is actually up near uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, Twin Sisters. Really nice hike through there, but this landslide actually took out part of that hiking trail. They've since rebuilt. But pretty incredible event. Um, definitely one of those ones where uh, if you know anybody who lived through it, you should talk to them uh, because this is really incredible. And that had over a billion dollars in damages. So when we talk about these wet years, dry years, wet years, dry years, we cannot leave out these back-to-back -back extremes that we recently had, 2011 and 2012. And so back in 2011, high, high, high precipitation out in Montana. And that led to flooding down the Missouri River. And so that impacted most of the states in the region. And it had an estimated impact of $2.1 billion. And so that lasted for much of the summer. So that was a really long event. And um, I know it was pretty interesting here. You have to make strange decisions when, when you have these big events going on. I know that Omaha Epley, their air filled up there, um, they started to have water bubbling up from the ground out near the airfield, and so they had to start drilling some wells. So, you know, if you're flying out of Epley, you had to make the decision, do you park at the airport in hopes that it doesn't flood, or do you try to leave your car with a friend that you have up there? Um, so this is me over at Gavin's Point. This is um, in July of 2011 the record flows coming out of there. But then switched to one year later, and we had historic drought and heat wave that impacted the whole entire region and also the Midwest. Unfortunately for parts of Kansas and Colorado, this was just an extension of several years of drought that they had already been under. And um, just want to point out this picture of burnt up corn, that's taken not too far away from the picture on the left of Gavin's Point. So they're both taken right there in southeast South Dakota, just about a year apart. So both pictures were taken in July, one in 2011, one in 2012. And that had a huge impact, um, not just to agriculture, but if you think about uh, infrastructure, so you can have settling of foundations and bursting of pipes, and so wide range of impacts from that drought, estimated impact of $31 billion. So we're going to turn our attention a little bit to snowfall here. So snowfall is just the average annual snowfall. You can see that a lot of the region gets somewhere between 20 and 40 inches of, of snow a year. Of course, the Rockies get a lot more. And it's very important to the region for a number of reasons. So if I not think that plain snowpack, mm, we don't get as much. Is that really that important? But it is, actually. And so the plain snowpack. One thing that it does is it helps reduce our wildfire risk. And another thing is in areas where winter wheat is grown, it helps provide some protection from the high winds and the cold temperatures that we get. So plain snowpack is important for those regards. And then the mountain snowpack, super important for the region, because all of our rivers are fed from the snowpack from the mountains. And so, like we see here, Plains are home to the Missouri River, the longest river in North America. Of course, we've got other rivers in the region, but 
have to point out the Missouri River because so many people do rely on the river and for a lot of things. So we we like the snowpack for skiing. So we like snowpack for recreation and tourism. We like the snowpack to feed the rivers that end up feeding the reservoirs. We can make energy out of those, right? So we can have power plants, um, hydroelectric power plants based off of that. We irrigate based off some of the water that comes out of the rivers. And so really important to the region because a very large region is dependent upon that snowpack that's coming out of the Rockies. And you can't mention that without mentioning our underground water, so the Ogallala Aquifer. And so that reaches from, we'll go outside the region a little bit here, so Texas, New Mexico through Oklahoma all the way up into South Dakota and Wyoming. And so we've got one of the largest underwater storage systems in the world. Um, and a lot of that is being used for irrigation. Um, some of that's being depleted, but huge uh, underwater source of water. So it's interesting that in a region where we are often limited by water, we also have a lot of water. So we're water rich and kind of water deficient all at the same time. It depends on how you look at it. But when we think about snowfall, you can't help but think of blizzards and, you know, in this region, we've got those high winds, and they're really common. So blizzards are a very common event in the in the High Plains region. Um, you know, I couldn't make a list of all of them. We have blizzards every single year, and uh, so I'll just go through a few important ones. So the Children's Blizzard of 1888. This is one that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, kind of hit people by surprise. It was pretty nice beforehand. You know, all the kids had gone off to school, and this blizzard hit, and a lot of kids were stuck. And it was a very tragic, tragic story. Lots of people um, were killed and injured uh, by the storm, and it really had an impact on popular culture. Even today, um, several books, songs, poems um, have been written based on the tragic event that happened back in 1888. There's also an interesting one in the records that um, maybe not as famous as the children's blizzard, but certainly incredibly impactful. So there's several blizzards in the winter of 1948 to 1949. And so starting about November 18th with the first blizzard, um, this region just got, just got slammed blizzard after blizzard after blizzard. There was at least three in the month of January alone. And so with no time to recover, the snow just kept piling up and piling up and piling up to the point where almost 250 people were trapped and could not get out. Um, and so you've got a pretty big disaster in your hands when you have that many people uh, trapped in snow, uh, underneath snow. And so um, the Air Force and the Army Corps of Engineers, they actually had a few operations where they had to go out and rescue people. They had to drop supplies. And they even had to drop hay for the poor cattle and sheep that were wandering around on these 30-foot snowdrifts with nothing to eat. So it was a really um, big situation. It affected a lot of people um, in a lot of states, so Colorado, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And so these pictures here are from the state of Wyoming. The one on the bottom is from Casper. So you can see a guy standing next to what looks to be a car. So big snow drifts filling in that area. And you can see the planes getting loaded up to do their lifts, um, to do their hay drops and supply drops to people. And so this is a pretty interesting event. And there's been some, uh, there's been a documentary uh, made uh, for, for the Wyoming perspective on that blizzard. And there also was a really interesting story um, written called, I'm Never Going to Be Snowbound Again, the winter of 1948-49. And that gives you a perspective of what happened in Nebraska. Um, so really big blizzards. This is definitely a, a situation that we don't want to see happen again. And then a recent blizzard, uh, just back in 2013, you might remember highlighted that historic flooding of September 2013. Um, that fall was pretty pretty tough on the region because just a month later, we had this big blizzard uh, that impacted Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. 
And so you can see down here, this is a satellite image. All this white is the coverage of the snow. So you can see the extent of that snow cover there. And what happened was, um, it's pretty early on in the season to get a blizzard. And so uh, ranchers had not brought their cab cattle in off of the fields. And so all these cattle, they were out in the fields as usual, like they normally would be. Storm spun up so fast, really wasn't time to get them out and back into shelter. And so uh, the blizzard hit. And unfortunately, we had a lot of uh, cattle loss due to that. About 20,000 cattle were lost in South Dakota alone. So it was a really tough cleanup, really hard on people. Um, North Dakota took a big hit uh, in terms of sunflowers. So there's a lot of sunflower loss. And this blizzard uh, cost at least four, $40 million. And I do want to point out that this blizzard, um, you know, it's early enough in the year that you can get our blizzard on one side, tornado on the other side type of event. And you can see down here that we did have a small uh, little tornado outbreak on the front side of that storm. So interesting event. Um, and, and pretty tragic for the ranchers that lost their cattle. And so we're talking about snowfall. Ice storms, not really, but it's a winter type storm, so we'll throw it in there. So ice storms don't happen in our region um, quite as often as other places, about one to three freezing rain days per year. Uh, maximum is up in the northeast. They get quite a few um, uh, ice storm events. and. Uh, but I wanted to highlight one that was pretty interesting. Back in December of 2007, we had widespread accumulations of one to two inches of ice in Kansas. And it was their costliest ice storm in history. It was about $136 million. And ooh, uh, lots of people out of power for, for a long time. And you can't talk ice storms without getting these really fun pictures out here. Look at this windmill just covered in ice. So this is a different ice storm. This is back in late December of 2006. Ice storm struck central Nebraska. Um, people were out of power for several weeks after that one. A lot of people upset they could not uh, watch the Huskers. Um, so maybe the moment you've all been waiting for. I know a lot of people said they were really interested in, um, in hearing about thunderstorms and severe weather. And so out here on the plains, we really can't Oh, sorry, off. Natalie. We're, we're out of time. We can't. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we can. We, I'm <laughs> just joking with you. Go, go right in. All right. So out here on the plains, we get lots of different types of severe weather. And a lot of these you've probably heard of before, like supercells and squall lines and bow echoes, tornadoes a little bit of everything when it comes to thunderstorms and severe weather. And so I picked out this nice picture um, here. It's a radar image. It shows a very long squall line traversing through the central and southern plains, just to give you a little tidbit here. So what I'm going to do is try to throw in some fun tidbits with a little climatology, and we'll see how that goes. So first, because Wyoming is not going to be featured in any of the next slides. I had to throw this in there. So Wyoming actually ranks among the lowest states in terms of loss of life and property due to severe weather, which is a great thing. But they're going to feel really left out in the next few slides. So I thought I'd throw in this one. They do get severe weather. So this is a picture from um, June of 2009 near Pine Bluff, Wyoming. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ken Dewey, he snapped this photo when he was out chasing out that way. So sorry, Wyoming, this might be about it for you, but get you thrown in there somehow. So when we think about thunderstorms, what do we have to have? We've got to have some lightning. And so i got to show off our new lightning climatology. So one of our um, former staff members who is now moved on, he created a lightning climatology. And we just now got this up onto our website, so got to show it off a little bit here. And so what we're looking at in this top photo here, top image, is the annual flash density. So what that's telling us is if we see these reds, you got more lightning. You see these blues, you don't have lightning. Okay, so for about, um, oh, almost a 20-year period, you can see that areas of Kansas, and then off to the east, like Missouri, off to the south in Oklahoma, has the highest number of flashes. And as we move 
further west, we have uh, we have lower numbers of flashes. And then if we look at January, this kind of our low point. Really don't get a whole lot of thunderstorms in January. The occasional thunder snow, I suppose, could occur. And then June, July is about our peak. As you can see, that um, got a lot more activity through here. And so you may be wondering if you're looking, if you're taking a close look, you're saying, well, what in the world is going on out there? There must be something wrong in the data. What is going on in Colorado? Well, I'll tell you. I'll get a little technical on you, but I'll explain it. This is due to the Denver Convergence Vorticity Zone. And this is one of these cool things that you don't learn about until one of your upper level meteorology classes, but makes total sense once you explain it. So you got that Palmer Divide jutting out into the plains. And when you get southeasterly winds coming up and over, those interact with the northwest flow coming off the foothills. And you get this convergence of winds. And converging winds lead to uplift and you get thunderstorms. You can also get, coincidentally, you also get um, higher tornadoes, uh, tornado rates there as well, um, due to the spin in the atmosphere there. But um, that's why we have more lightning occurrence in that area of Colorado. So you can look up the abbreviation T BCVZ if you're really interested in learning more about it, but just an interesting feature of the plains and how the geography really can impact what's going on there. So we'll move on. We'll do uh, severe wind climatology. And I have got a super nifty little thing here from the Storm Prediction Center. And we can look at the wind probabilities throughout the year. Oh, that's maybe a little fast. I'll slow that down a little bit there. So we're looking through the spring. And you can see those probabilities increase. And as we move into the fall, they decrease again. So we can watch that one more time going into the winter. Probabilities decrease. As we move into the spring, move into the summer, those probabilities increase a lot. And you can see that really the highest risk is to our east, but we still do get that risk for high wind events. And so just going to highlight um, something here. So North Dakota, they've had some derecho events come through. It's a high wind event, um, really common to the east of us, but we do get these out here on the plains. Um, so just thought I'd highlight this one. So uh, starting July 12th into July 13th, uh, this was the second of two events that actually occurred. There was another high wind event just the day before. And we had 70 mile an hour winds in Bismarck and 91 mile an hour winds in Fargo. As you can see, that, that storm traversed a very long way in a short amount of time. Didn't take very long. Each of those lines is a three-hour interval. So it didn't take long for that storm to traverse the region and knock over cars and all sorts of things. So we will move on to a tornado climatology. So let's look at that. Get this pulled up here. I think these maps are pretty interesting. It really shows, instead of just seeing like one map for the whole year, you can really take a look at how that evolves throughout the year. So we'll see. So we're in the winter. You can see the risk is really down in the southeast United States. And as we move through late spring, early summer, moves up through the plains, dies back down, starts to come back up as we move through winter into the spring. Really got that peak over there in May. So coming up not too long from now. You can see that here. So this is kind of our, our peak for tornado probabilities for our region. And let's talk a little bit about those. So I thought this is pretty interesting because some of the oldest known photographs of tornadoes were from the High Plains region. And this photo has been passed around quite a bit. A lot of people think it's the oldest known photograph of a tornado. It was taken back in 1884 um, near Howard, South Dakota. Uh, as you can see, if you've ever seen a picture of a tornado, you think, well, this doesn't look quite right. And it is believed that it has been doctored. It's been edited from the original. So no surprise there. So it's been passed around as maybe the oldest known photograph of a tornado. But as it turns out, um, it actually occurred just earlier that year. Um, a photographer um, 
snap this photo as a tornado passed near Garnett, Kansas. And there's a whole story about these two photographs and how they came to be in this WeatherWise article. And I'll be sharing these slides afterwards, so don't worry about writing that down. It's a really long URL. If you want to look that up, um, you'll see that in the slides later. But pretty interesting that, that this is what it looks like. And the two men who took these photos, um, they sold them extensively and made some money off of them. So uh, people still doing that today. So not uh, nothing's changed, I guess, on that front. So there's too many tornadoes to talk about in one presentation. So I thought I'd highlight two tornado events. Um, one is the second largest tornado to have ever occurred, occurred in our region. This was an F4 tornado, so that's F4, not EF4, because this was before the EF scale was, was uh, implemented. Uh, this is back in May of 2004. Uh, if you're familiar with tornadoes, you've probably heard about this. The Hallam tornado had a very long path length. The tornado was on the ground for 52 miles, and it was two and a half miles wide. So very wide tornado. Poor town of Hallam was destroyed. Um, and the record was broken back in 2013 by the El Reno tornado with a width of 2.6 miles. You may be wondering, well, why does that say F3? I heard that that tornado was an F3. And as it turns out, because the EF scale um, has to do with damage, not measured winds, it officially ranks as an EF3. But I know that some of you out there caught that, so I had to, had to clear that up. So you can see that was a pretty big day um, for Nebraska and Iowa resulting in very large tornadoes. We also lay claim to the second highest elevation tornado on record. This happened back in July of 2012. Pretty interesting because, uh, as you can see in the drought monitor down here at the bottom, this was our big drought year recently. And so we had this tornado. It occurred near the summit of Mount Evans, up at nearly 12,000 feet. Not quite high enough to break the record that California holds, but still pretty cool in my mind. Can't say I've ever seen a tornado up in the mountains of Colorado. Now let's move on to hail. We can look at a hail climatology real quick here. Oh, I've lost my hail climatology window. That's OK. We'll just take a look at this here. All these climatologies are available on the Storm Prediction Center's webpage, and so you can go through all of those. We kind of have a maximum hail climatology out here um, in June. So May and June are big hail months, and you can see that uh, right here through Kansas and Nebraska, Colorado, high probability for hail. And so the one, uh, there's a couple of hail storms that I want to highlight. The first occurred back in uh, June of 2014. And June of 2014 was a really big month um, for severe weather. You may remember seeing pictures of the uh, double tornadoes in Pilgrim, Nebraska. Uh, that got a lot of coverage. That actually happened later in the month, so this was not a part of this storm system. So on June 3rd, uh, we Softball and baseball size hail teamed up with 80 mile an hour winds. And you know what? Nothing stands a chance. Really doesn't. Um, so uh, lots of damage occurred to vehicles, houses, crops. People were even injured. Um, pretty, uh, pretty impactful event there. Uh, just You can see pictures of houses with the um, siding shredded off. Lots of uh, car lots north of Omaha in the Blair, Nebraska area, and thousands of cars were just completely uh, battered up by hail, and so you can see that there. And actually, Greg Carbon um, from the Storm Prediction Center, he coined this weather as Nebraska, um, and I would agree with that because this really was a really high event, over a billion dollars in damage just from this alone. And then, of course, you can't talk about hail in the High Plains region and not talk about the record-breaking hail that we've had. And so on the left here, we've got the one from Aurora, Nebraska. happened back in 2003. and actually held several records. 
until the Vivian, South Dakota hailstone fell back in 2010. And so the Aurora, Nebraska hailstone still holds the record for largest circumference at nearly 19 inches. And then the Vivian uh, has the highest diameter at 8 inches and a weight of almost 2 pounds. And so um, very interesting to see pictures of. Can't say I'd want to see it in real life because it probably means that um, I'm calling up the insurance company. So with that, I think I'm right at about an hour. So I'm going to leave some links up here. Of course, you'll have access to these slides afterwards. And so you can access all the cool maps and station search tools. And if you're interested in reading some of our climate summaries, finding out about impacts, we got that too. And I'm always here if you have questions or need some climate data for whatever reason, feel free to give me a call. Feel free to email me. That's what I'm here for. So with that, I'll turn it over to some questions. Thanks, Natalie. A great presentation. Boy, a lot of information there and, and quite a variety of weather that you guys, uh, well, uh, here in Colorado as well, on the high plains. Uh, we've, got, we've got some questions coming in right now. Uh, here's one, just a reminder. Uh, Larry writes that uh, coming up on June 8th will be the 50th anniversary of the F5 tornado that hit Topeka, Kansas. So just uh, just uh, looking at that uh, when you speak about tornadoes coming through. Henry? Um, uh, yeah. This is Noah. I wanted to ask a question uh, to no, Natalie right while, ahead. Sure. while you're organizing the ones from the from the uh, volunteers writing in. Natalie, uh, you don't have to go back to the slide, but early on um, in the presentation with temperature, you mentioned that Christmas Eve uh, high temperature spike. And I'm curious, I've, heard, I've only read of these uh, events that called a heat burst. Is that something you're familiar with on the, on the, in the Great Plains? And was that a heat burst event that, that night? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so that actually was not a heat burst event. So a lot of times what happens is um, you can have thunderstorms that collapse and can actually cause a heat burst. So you can see this spike in temperatures. And um, so sometimes that can happen, and then the temperature will go back down. So it's kind of a, um, a fleeting moment of, of, a, of a spike in temperatures. But this was actually um, just consistent southwesterly flow, and we had um, lots of widespread warm temperatures across the region. Thanks. I appreciate it. Great question. Thanks. Yeah. And if you do have a question for Natalie, we'll take those if you want to type them in. Make sure you put in your, your name and where you're writing from. Here's one uh, from Andreas, and she's wondering why snowfall is so often just reported in inches rather than uh, also including the, the inches of water equivalent. And we know Kokoros observers take both. Uh, it is a little more difficult to get that Swiss, uh, the uh, snow water equivalent. Maybe you could just talk about that quickly. Oh, sure. Yeah, and you know what? From a climatologist's point of view, knowing both is so very important because you could have 20 inches of snow and only an inch of water in there, or you could have really heavy wet snow. You could have just a few inches of snow um, with an inch of water. And so knowing how much water is contained in that snowfall is very important. Um, especially for for things like water resources or knowing how much snowpack really is up in the up in the mountains, and I think that um, a lot of times what you see on maybe in the media on TV, uh, they just report things out as oh we had this really big event, Leeds, South Dakota got 55 inches of snow, um, and my guess is that um, even though the measurements of the snow water equivalent are there, um, it might be one of those things that's a little more complicated to talk about and communicate, and so just ends up coming across as just the snowfall amount, snow depth. But, but really, um, for climatologists and hydrologists and any folks working in the water resources sector, both are very important. Um, we, we, we couldn't just have the snowfall amount. We've got to have that, wa that snow water equivalent as well. OK, thanks. Here's, here's a, some lightning questions we've got coming in. One from Paul in Evergreen, Colorado, 
and Alessandro also writes one. So let's let's kind of combine these quick uh, together. Where do you find the lightning climatology maps? Asked Paul. And then the other question is, why is there so much lightning in Kansas and Missouri? Great question. So the lightning climatologies, um, I believe they just got added to our website. So what I can do is um, I can edit this last slide. I'll pop that link on there. And then uh, when this gets posted to the Weather Talk uh, website, it'll be on there for you. And then, um, yeah, as far as the lightning, having so having more lightning down in uh, Kansas and Missouri, um, so they get they get more thunderstorms on average. They're a little closer to that uh, moisture source, and so they get thunderstorms a um, little, uh, I guess, a little earlier in the year, and then also a little later in the year than other parts of the region. So they just have more thunderstorms. Okay, Nicholas writes in, and this one's just going to jog your memory a little bit. Uh, climatologically, what factors were in play that made the 2014 that made 2014 a highly active, severe weather season for southern and eastern Nebraska? Oh wow, wow, that's a good question, and uh, and you know that was a really impactful year um, for a lot of for a lot of Nebraska, and so. I would have to go back and actually look at the um, the airflow in the upper levels to see, but my guess is that you know if you if you get stuck in a pattern sometimes where the storm track continually goes over one place, um, you just you'll get that severe weather over and over in that one place. And so we've been seeing that a lot. Um, you know, you can get stuck in these patterns of wet or dry, and so you have the storm tracks going over continually. That's a really great question. I don't remember right offhand exactly what the conditions were like, but I could definitely look that up and provide a follow-up. Um, it was very impactful for me. Uh, my basement flooded that June, and so we had to redo the basement. So it was, it was big for a lot of people. Yeah, if you can follow up with email, we'll have that, that uh, person's uh, email for you to follow up with. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here's Mike. He's actually with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and he's writing in wanting to know, does the High Plains Regional Climate Center provide access to data and graphic summaries for all 48 states, Alaska, and the U.S. territories? Do you guys have that as well? Great question. Yes, so as far as data are concerned, we've got data for the whole entire country. Um, graphics, we do have a lot of maps that are provided for the whole country. So we have maps that are updated on a daily basis uh, that you can see. We also have an archive of about 20,000, 25,000 maps. So a lot of those uh, precipitation maps um, that I showed um, that actually had dates on them, those came straight from our website. So that would be the second link here on this how do I find out more slide. As far as um, like writing up reports about impacts, or adding that historical basis. So our center does a lot for just the High Plains region and the Missouri Basin. But each of the centers that I showed, there's a slide that shows all six centers and their coverage. All of us do write monthly and quarterly reports that tie together those impacts with the, the climate conditions. And so each you could cover the whole, the whole country like that, or the National Centers for Environmental Information they do nationwide kind of composites of what's been going on. So lots of resources out there, and I'd be happy to share links for all of that for anyone who's interested. OK, Mary from Wisconsin writes, and she wants to know, is cloud-to-ground lightning counted differently from the lightning we see that visually tracks across the sky, uh, across the cloud? So in cloud, I guess, those strikes you're showing are those uh, counted differently. So cloud to ground, uh, those are actually strikes, but in cloud, diff uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for the lightning climatology, does that include cloud to cloud lightning, or does that include cloud to ground? And so that's going to be those cloud to ground strikes. A lot more lightning, um, you know, does occur within clouds, um, but we, we're doing the, the cloud to ground because that's what that's what's impacting people, um, and that's what the uh, I believe that's what the uh, National Lightning Detection Network 
records. I know you can get um, some satellite information on lightning that's cloud to cloud. Um, but I'd have to brush up on some of that. I have to go back and read a few papers to find out exactly. But but this is the, the cloud to ground. Yep. Uh, Bill in central Wyoming, he's an emergency manager there, and he's wondering if you have an easy statement you can give citizens about the difference between climatology and meteorology. He's just looking for a good talking point. What, what, isn't there a famous one? Uh, climate is what you, oh man, I'm, I'm forgetting how it goes. Now, Noah, you may remember too, but uh, Natalie, you probably know that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there are two things that I like to tell people. So one, one easy one to remember is climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Or climate informs you of what wardrobe to buy and weather tells you what piece to pick out. Okay, so you might have, a comp so somebody living in um, Pierre, South Dakota is going to have a whole different wardrobe than someone living in Miami, Florida. But on if any given day, you could actually wear the same clothes from there. You're just going to have a bigger range of clothes options in Pierre. So you're going to have hats and gloves and coats and boots along with your shorts and your flip-flops and your t-shirts and your jeans. Whereas in Miami, you probably just have a lot of flip-flops and shorts and not so much in the hats and gloves arena. So, so that climate kind of tells you your range of conditions and the weather's telling you what it's going to be that one day. So when you think about the continuum, kind of the weather and climate continuum, you really, really just think about time scales. So weather, you can think about what is happening outside my window right now. What's going to happen today, this evening? What's going to happen tomorrow? Maybe what's going to happen the next day? And as you get further and further away, you start to move into climate. So we start to average all of those individual weather days to get up to our climate. So we get our averages, we get our ranges, we get those extremes. So maybe that answers the question. Maybe that's too much. No, that's that's a great uh, that's a great. We'll have to use that one here. We haven't hadn't heard about the wardrobe one. Okay, we're gonna, we've got two more questions we're going to take, and then those that we aren't able to get today, uh, Natalie will answer by email. We're just a little pressed for time as we wind things up. Tommy from Virginia wants to know is if the Wyoming Blizzard documentary from your slides, is there a link uh, to that that we can have and we'll put on the website? Yes. So the, so the link that was on the slide, which will be provided, that will take you to um, a page that talks about the um, the event and also has a link to the video where you can watch it right there. So if you'll send me that, I'll, I'll add that to our, our Coco Ross Weather Talk page and, and under Natalie's talk, there'll be a list of resources. We'll put the ones you see on the screen now and also that uh, additional pieces we'll, we'll add to that too, so that's great. Okay, last question of the day. And uh, Natalie, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to to be with us. This is a great presentation. We'll archive that. And I'm sure a lot of folks will access it uh, for, for great knowledge uh, if you want to know about the High Plains. Here it is. Mike writes, uh, how do you define snowpack in terms of days, months, seasons? What he's, he's curious, how do you define that? Oh, wow. That's a great question. So when we think about snowpack in the Rockies and we're thinking about, well, are we going to have uh, what kind of snow melt season are we going to have? And, um, you know, are we going to experience some flooding or is it going to be drier? So what we're talking about there is that snow water equivalent, okay? So we have to know how much water is in that snowpack. Because you may have a huge snowpack in terms of just actual inches of snow, but if it's really dry snow, you're not going to get as much snow melt coming out of there. But if you have a really heavy wet snowpack up there, then you're going to have more water. And so it's really that snow water equivalent that's really important in terms of the snowpack. So knowing how much water we can expect to come down and, and flow into our rivers and fill our reservoirs. That's the important part. Okay, well, thank you again. Uh, we're going to wind it up for now. Uh, appreciate you coming on our show today. And uh, again, Natalie's presentation presentation is being recorded. We'll have this up later in the week uh, and uh, all that. A lot of folks are, are typing in right now. Wonderful talk and oh, this is great. Uh, so a lot, a lot of people really appreciate you coming on today. Well, well it was fun. Oh, oh yeah, it is great. 
Well, we're gonna we're gonna move uh, to our next webinar. Uh, just to let you guys know out there again. Thanks again, Natalie. Uh, Thursday, June twenty third. Mark that on your calendars. That's uh, in a couple of weeks, and this will be the third part of our six part climate series. Uh, we will have Nina Oakley from the Western Regional Climate Center, and she's going to look at the weather and climate of the West. So we've hit the Midwest, we've hit the High Plains, we're going to be looking at the West. And so again, that's Thursday, June 23rd. You can sign up for that now on our Coco Ross Weather Talk website if you go there. So again, uh, we want to thank everyone uh, for being with us today. And uh, don't forget uh, to take that survey as you leave the broadcast. And uh, so for Henry, well, Henry, that's me, for, for Noah and the, the rest of the crowd, sorry about that, uh, of the Coco Ross uh, headquarters team, we want to say goodbye. Have a great afternoon. Take care.